by manufacturing. So why is this important? So basically, this is an advance where we use microbes to make specialty chemicals, compounds like plastics, fuels, materials, and then um, these have led to an advance as an alternative to petrochemicals. So I don't know if you follow the news today, but basically the earth is on fire. We have a huge problem with carbon emissions, with climate change, and so we're really not doing nearly enough about this. And so I can have a whole other talk just on this problem, but basically it's up to you, um, you know, young people to help with this. Um, people like me, we, you know, we do what we can, but it's really the earth is, you all, y'all are inheriting this and y'all have to work together to make this a better place. And part of that is through, you know, moving away from these petrochemicals, other uh, ways of doing things. So, bioengineering or biomanufacturing. This has become a really hot topic now, all the way up to the executive level. And so the reason is this last statement here, is that the bioengineering is gonna account for a third of global output for manufacturing by the end of this decade. That is gonna be a value of $30 trillion. And so right now, the um, US GDP is $21 trillion. So this gives you kind of an idea of the scale and, and the impact that bioengineering and biomanufacturing will have in the future. So a little bit about me. So this is me here with the mullet. Um, so I, I was a student at UGA. Um, I was a, a, started as a chemistry major, became a biochemistry major. And as part of our training, I had to do research. And so like a lot of students, I had trouble finding a lab. I didn't know kind of what I wanted to do. And a buddy of mine said, hey, I want, um, I've want. i got this professor. This is uh, Professor Lars Yundahl. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was like this super famous scientist. He has a bacteria and pathway named after him. And so I went into his office and he's like, well, you know, your grades aren't so good, but I'll take you anyway. And I was able to impress him. And actually, I... I direct admitted to grad school in this lab after I graduated. And I decided this is what I wanted to do. And basically what we're interested in is um, breakdown of agricultural waste. So what is a good way to break down waste? Well, you can feed it to a cow. So cows eat a lot of grasses. They turn that into energy and biomass. And they have microorganisms that help them do that. And one, one of those organisms is this fungus here. This is an anaerobic fungus, so it's a really weird. It, it doesn't have mitochondria. It grows anaerobically, and it grows specifically inside of the cow. And so if you're driving around Athens, you might see a cow like this. It has this little portal on the side. And so what you can do is you can take this out. It's like a little door and put your hand in there. You have gloves on. Um, actually, a guy I went to high school with does microbiome research, so he's got, I couldn't find a picture in him, unfortunately, but he puts his hand inside there, you grab the grass, and I'll just say, you can isolate the bacteria and fungi that are associated with that plant material. And so my role was, we had this activity that we knew basically breaks down this linkage between lignin and hemicellulose. So lignin is the stuff that's in trees that makes the branches really tough and how the branches can grow like sideways. They're the strength and then hemicellulose connects with the cellulose. That's the, you know, the, the main part of the, the tree. And so there's this activity and basically I had to purify the activity and determine the, the genetic sequence of that. And nowadays we can sequence genomes as super easy, but you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't so such an easy problem. And so I was able to do that. This was the first example of this enzyme called a ferruloyl esterase. We um, were able to get the crystal structure of that. That's the structure there. And then we also showed that as part of a bigger enzyme complex that's involved in the breakdown of plant biomass. And so this is really how organisms can convert sugars, which is essentially what cellulose is. It's a bunch of glucose connected together into useful products. And so... I leveraged that um, into uh, a job. Um, and what I should say before that, I was really interested in industry, even at the beginning of my career. 
So I was fortunate enough to be able to do an internship at uh, Janinkor out in California. They're now part of DuPont. And so I kind of got my first taste of industry experience at that job. I then moved on to San Diego and got a job with this company called Diversa. Diversa's interest is in um, enzyme engineering. And so what they do is they'll take the, um, they'll take dirt. So like you can go out anywhere and, and take a scoop of dirt. There's going to be, you know, millions of, of bacteria in that dirt. Now, only about 1% of those organisms can be cultured in a lab. And that's a major problem for microbiology. So everything we know about bacteria is sort of limited to those organisms. But what we can do is we can extract the DNA from those bacteria. And what we do is we can then take that DNA and put that into a, a genetic system we can control and find novel enzymes. And so, you know, I mentioned I had found this one enzyme when I went, when I was in grad school and it took me, you know, six years to do it. I get to diverse at day one, they tell me, oh, we've got 300 of these things. I'm like, you're kidding me. You know, so that kind of told me the power of industry research and, and what it can do. And we had several projects. We've had projects with biofuels. We have projects with, with Dow Chemical and with Syngenta, which is an ag chemical company. Um, some of the places, I didn't actually get to go here. Some of the places, this is a Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park where uh, Thermos Thermopolis and Pac polymerase were found. This is a mountain in Kamchatka in Russia, which is where our luminase enzyme product, oh, my box got moved, was the, the DNA for it was found in Russia. And so we had agreements with all these uh, groups across the globe. Um, while I was there, I was the starting family. We went through a few layoffs. There's a lot of drama in our company. And I said, this is like, I want to do something different. Now. I've been working in biofuels and bi this area for quite a while. I said, I need to broaden my portfolio. And so I made the, the decision to move to Nashville, Tennessee and take up music. No, I'm just kidding. I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, but I took up a different area. So I got um, into a lab that was focused in a totally different area than what I did in grad school and at Diversa. And this is kind of the path. Everybody has a different path. You know, y'all are in college now or and you, you may you know, maybe know exactly like, oh, I want to graduate, I'm going to go to medical school, I'm going to get this degree, I'm going to start my practice. And, but maybe you're like, well, you know, I don't know. Or, you know, maybe you, you, you know, don't know what you want or you want to, you know, explore other opportunities, which is what college is for. It's, you know, it, you're here to get a degree, but you're also here to leverage the experience, you know, like Ashok and the other professors here. Um, because this is the only time, you know, that you're going to have this opportunity uh, with so much access to people. And so um, getting back to this story, so I went uh, to Vanderbilt University. I worked for this uh, gentleman, uh, Dr. James Crow, and he is interested in the B cell response to viruses. Now, viral diseases are kind of a hot topic these days. And so back in 2008, the big worry at the time was bird flu. So, so H5N1 is bird flu. You may have heard of H1N1, that's a regular flu. Uh, they all have different numbers. And the H stands for hemagglutinin. This is the hemagglutinin molecule. So it's a trimeric protein. And so this is the, the, um, the attachment protein of influenza. And so what we would do was we would make this protein in the lab, but that was just one part of the project. What we're really interested in was what happens when you get infected with a virus. And so basically we all know that you have an immune response and part of that is your antibody response. And so B cells make antibodies. And so we isolated the B cells. And we played some tricks on them. We added some chemicals and a, and a virus to make them grow longer than they normally would. And the reason why we do this is most of your human cells, unless you have cancer, they will not grow very long. And so only cancer cells are really um, immortal and, and can grow long enough to be useful in the lab. And so we did this. We were able to outgrow some of these, these cells. We, we then used molecular biology to isolate their heavy and light chain genes to understand what they 
they do. And so we we're able to find antibodies that can neutralize the, the uh, bird flu. Uh, I had a second project where we were looking at a virus called vaccinia, and that's a cousin to monkeypox. And so we actually have antibodies that can neutralize monkeypox, which who knows that was going to be in the news these days. And so we had those antibodies. And so um, I left the Dr. Crow's lab in um, 2011. And since then, he's worked on COVID. That's an obvious target uh, for him. Their lab was able to develop this product called Evusheld that's now licensed by AstraZeneca. And what it is, it's two antibodies. So if you get COVID, you basically, they give you a shot with these two antibodies and it can help give you passive immunity from the coronavirus. And so this was developed using survivors of COVID that they then isolated their B cells and found these antibodies. And so I'll, I'm kind of proud that I was part of the development of that technology. And we're now going on to use that to do other things like working with this company, Vipira. They're interested in um, uh, snake bites. So, the products that can be used to treat snake bites are not very good. That's basically horse serum, which if you get treated twice with that, you can have a immune response. The safety profile is really crappy. And so we're going to find antibodies that can neutralize uh, snake venom in the future. So pretty cool stuff. Um, so like I said, I'm working in the lab, you know, enjoying what I'm doing. And then I don't know if you all appreciate that. I think this is a UGA. So we have this like calling all dogs. So I get the call to apply for a job at UGA, and that now led me to being director of this facility. So now I'm director of the Bioexpression Fermentation Facility, or the BFF, as we're known around campus. And so we have, we do a lot of what I call unit operation. So a unit operation is a is a basically a process. So we do fermentation, uh, we purify proteins. We do uh, mammalian cell culture. We, have, we also have a BSL-3 lab to work on different organisms. And then we also produce the monoclonal antibodies like I did at Vanderbilt University. Um, and so what do we do? So, so we're running processes. So what is, what is a process? So process is basically a bunch of steps that get you to, a, to some objective. And so for us, we're taking biomass and we're doing different things and we may want to crystallize that and get a 3D structure like I did in UHD. Um, and we have different goals. You know, we may want to increase the product yield. We may have contaminants we want to get rid of, cost, robustness of, of this product quality, you name it. And so what we do kind of depends on our goals. And so how do we get to those goals? So you may have a process like fermentation. You have inputs, which would be cells. And then you have factors that you can control, like the temperature and, the, and the, the media you grow the cells on. And then you have uncontrollable factors. That could be, that's what I call biology. Just stuff happens in biology you can't control. And you have an alpha, maybe you want protein. And so this is kind of a process. So we do lots of different processes. And so understanding that is really important to be able to create products and, and do research. Um, so what do, what do we do? So this is fermentation. So we have, um, the only pilot plant in the Southeast, and we have one of the biggest pilot plants in, in all of the U.S. And so we have systems like this. This is a, a fermenter. So this looks different. Maybe you've been to like a craft brewery before and seen these really big tanks that have kind of a cone at the bottom. This isn't the same as brewing beer kind. These are tanks that are specially designed to do a lot of different control and monitoring of conditions that you normally wouldn't do if you're brewing beer. I mean, that process has been known for thousands of years. What we're trying to do is a whole new process that has never been done before. And so we can do things like monitor the temperature, the pH, and the oxygen level. The other thing that's, that fermenters can do is they can control those. So you can create what are called controlled loops. So I'll give you an example. So pH, so we all know, if um, if you um, you have uh, ability to measure pH via pH meter, you may have used these. And so if we can do what's called a set point. So if I set the pH at 5.0, if the pH increases to say six, what do I need to do? I'm asking y'all 
What do I need to do to go from pH 6 to pH 5? So I need to add some liquid to that to drop the pH down. What would I add to go from 6 to 5? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Acid. You need to add acid. And so we can create a loop where the fermenter basically says, oh, the pH went to 6. I need to add acid to get it back down to 5. So that's a, a control loop. And so you can create lots of different control loops. Um, you can do things like add in liquids that, you know, acid based, you can add in feed to the system. Um, so that, that would be called a fed fermentation or fed batch fermentation. So mostly industry uses fed batch because you get higher yields. We talk about the process and optimizing things. You get higher yields with a fed batch. You can do that with a fermenter. You can, the fermenter has all these valves, you know, all the valves and everything can be controlled via the computer control system. Okay. Next step. So if we're doing a fermentation, um, so if you've ever grown cells in the lab, if you have a small amount, say of one liter or less, you can use a floor centrifuge and harvest your cells. If you have, say, hundreds of liters, it becomes very difficult. So in industry, we use what's called continuous centrifugation. So this is a continuous centrifuge where, you know, liquid comes in and cells get um, trapped inside of here, they actually look like this. They kind of coat inside of this long tube that's inside the fermenter, and then the waste goes out. And so the, the continuous centrifuge is how we would harvest cells in industry. And that's not something you would see yet a, in a regular lab. We also use something called tangential flow filtration. So how many of you like coffee? We were talking about going to Starbucks this morning. So how do we make coffee? You guys know the answer to that, right? You have a filter, right? And you put coffee in it and you drip liquid through. So what does the filter do? It basically prevents all those coffee grounds from getting into the coffee. So this is, think of this as like that, but on a different scale. So we have products that stay inside of the filter, like the coffee grounds that are bigger than the pores inside the membrane. And then everything else goes through, that's called the permeate. So like that would be your coffee in this situation. And so this is kind of how we do um, do the, uh, the the filtration step. This is what they look like. So these are hollow fiber. They kind of look like a bunch of spaghetti noodles, but those noodles are each of the little tubes that make up the, the filter system. And then we have what are called plate and frame, which are cassettes that you can stack. This is like, I don't know, 20 or 30 stacked together. Um, and this is important where you have a product that is secreted from the cell. So one example would be beer. So we have a yeast cell and it secretes ethanol. So you can separate that cell from ethanol using this system. So the cells would stay here, all the ethanol would go through the membrane in, in that unit operation. Homogenization. So, um, you know, insulin is one of the big success stories in biomanufacturing. It used to be if you wanted to make insulin, you would have to use, you would use a uh, pig organ, so the pancreas of a pig. Um, the insulin molecule is only one amino acid different from humans, so they could use that as a drug. But you would need 10,000 kilograms of this pancreas to get one kilogram of insulin. Not very efficient. And so the initial innovators of this insulin process, they were able to treat some kids, but if they quickly ran out of insulin and the, the children end up dying. A lot of people die for years and years because of um, the not being able to access insulin. Now we have a problem where people are charging too much for insulin and it's, it's something where you can make it on a very cheap level. There actually are initiatives, there's an open insulin project where they're, People are trying to make insulin themselves in the lab to mimic that process. But basically, the first uh, step to doing that is you grow E. coli, which is a bacterium you've probably heard of. That makes insulin. You, you then need to get that molecule out of the cell. We use something called homogenization. So homogenizers are basically high-pressure systems where you have a liquid stream that comes in. It goes under pressure, and then it shoots out of this little orifice here and becomes homogenous. 
This is the same process they use in dairy to homogenize milk. So if you ever been on a farm and you milk a cow, I've done this, the milk will separate, the milk fat will separate. So you homogenize this, you get that white liquid that people are used to drinking. So you maybe people don't, don't appreciate it like they used to. Um, another unit operation, chromatography. So in, in this situation, we're trying to separate molecules based on certain properties. So you could, that property could be the charge of the molecule. It could be the hydrophobic residues of the molecule, or it could be the size. And this is a very simple case where we're, we're looking at a mixture of proteins that are between 60 kilodons and five kilodons. And so you push the material through the column and what's gonna happen is your bigger proteins are gonna go through the column first and your smaller proteins will come out last. So that and that way you can separate big proteins from little proteins. And then you can imagine there's other ways to, to do this as far as um, the, the charge of the protein and other aspects, like I said before. Um, and this is what it looks like on a what we call a chromatogram. So we use the absorbance at 280 to look at kind of where these proteins are coming out of the column. So this is a very typical process used to purify lots of different proteins. So like that insulin product, once you break open the cells, you can't just inject that in your body, you would die basically if you injected just E. coli lysate. So you have to purify that product to make it to a pharmaceutical grade. And that's, this is one way to do it. Okay, another unit operation, spray drying. So if we, uh, there's a company in Augusta called Manus Vital. They make um, artificial sweeteners. They actually took over a plant from the company used to make aspartame or NutraSweet. And so here you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of liters of fermentation broth. And so you can, separate all the material. So you say you produce your, your sugar. So you've got say 500,000 liters of liquid. Well, how do you get that to a point where you can put it in one of those little paper packets and you know have it at your restaurant? Well, you have to dry the material. Um, there's other products like um, milk, you know, dried milk, yeast extract. They all use something like this called spray drying, where you have a liquid, it gets atomized, and then there's a, there's a drying chamber, and then you um, you have a dry product at the end. So this is another unit operation that has to be done to create these products. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about, so maybe I've uh, piqued your interest a little bit in, in biotechnology. Um, so where, where are the jobs? And so when we think about jobs, I think about venture capital. And so the top 10 places here, these are states that are investing in biotechnology. I mean, Georgia is too, but these are the top 10. So a lot of the jobs um, are gonna be in California and the Northeast like Boston, but um, you will find there's kind of a, a, you know, certain jobs like R and D jobs are gonna be on the coast. You're gonna have jobs where you're making products that require a feedstock. So like corn, to ethanol. They're not going to do that in Boston. You know, they're not going to truck, you know, a ton of corn to Boston and convert. They're going to do it in Iowa. Just like here, we have lots of lots of trees, right? I mean, you go on the road and you see those big logging trucks. They they take all the branches off the tree. Well, what happens to those branches? They basically rot. Well, you can take that material, you can convert that into a, a chemical like ethanol using biotechnology. So there's lots of opportunities. This is where the investment is. We really wanna see more investment in Georgia. Um, so where are the career opportunities? So if you do get these type of jobs, so you have um, you know, different sectors within here. You have research, testing medical, um, drugs and pharmaceuticals. This would be more what we call biopharmaceuticals. So that would be things like vaccines, antibodies, stem cells, that sort of thing. And then we have, um, you know, different areas like distribution and um, agricultural feedstock and industrial bioscience. That would be things like your biofuels. Um, so these are kind of the, the average salaries. So biofarmers, 113. San Francisco, you make about $160,000 on average, but it's very expensive to live in San Francisco. So if you, if you, um, you know, the, the average salary is a little lower for ag 
these sock jobs, but the cost of living is much lower in those those parts of the country as well. So you kind of have to kind of take this numbers with a grain of salt. But the message here is there's jobs, they pay really well. People are begging me for people to, to apply for these jobs. Um, so how do we solve this problem or, or contribute to the problem? So we have this master biomanufacturing program. So it's basically this link between biotechnology industry and our bioeconomy. So workforce development is um, a significant part of the USG's goal as far as workforce development. Um, we have um, what we call double dogs. So every area has like dog associated with it, EGA. So double dog is like a dual degree. Um, but really our master's pro you can get done in one, it's two semesters for a double dog. The traditional program would be three semesters plus a summer internship. And so this program, we trained over 50 students. They've gone to a different job. You're gonna, today you're going to hear from uh, Tariq. So he's one of our first students that graduated. And um, uh, another gentleman that will be on the call today. And um, and so these, these folks, um, you know, they get trained and then they're able to get these high paying jobs in industry. I, I call this like an MBA for science. So it's not a traditional master's program where you go in, you work in a lab, you get an assistantship. This is where you come in, it's a professional program, you pay tuition, you you know, you go through the classes and we help you get a job. The internships are typically paid, you know, they pay you know anywhere from twenty to twenty-seven dollars an hour just for the internship. So, you know, it's um there is some benefit as far as that as well. This is our program of study. It's like I said, um, it can be done in three semesters. We kind of split this up into four. A lot of people do it that way, um, but you can add some extra classes. So we have things like regulations and ethics. I teach bioprocess technology where I go through all those steps I told you about. Um, biochemical engineering, we have electives. We have a fermentation engineering lab and um, business classes that you take to fill out the uh, program. We have a training lab where we have equipment and some of this was donated by scientific bioprocessing to Taylor's here today. Um, and so we, we do all the hands-on training in there. I'm, I'm a big proponent of hands-on training. Um, these are some of the, the companies that we've worked with and, and our students have gone to. Uh, Tariq, he's currently with Sartorius, which is an equipment manufacturer. Um, we've worked, uh, people have gone to uh, InRail, um, Takeda, uh, Bear, also some local breweries. And um, so we, we also have connections to a manufacturing center for other companies like Pfizer, Bear, Beringer, Ingelheim, which is in Athens, um, and other companies like Calion. So we're going to have the CEO of Calion on today, uh, Darcy Prather. Um, and so, you know, a lot of opportunities. Um, also work with some companies in Germany. Um, so, hey, if you want to move to Germany or um, anywhere you know, around the world, we probably have somewhere where we could place you. Um, so how do, how do we work? So we work with these manufacturing innovation institutes. So, so what are these? So these are based the institutes that help connect industry with academic researchers. And one, I was in D.C. earlier this week at their um, a workshop, and they everybody brings up this term of valley and depth. And what it means is you have academic research and then you have commercial manufacturing. And so getting from academic research, idea in a research lab to manufacturing, there's this kind of valley of death in the middle that I that's where our dreams go to die. And so what these institutes do is they're supposed they are well they are helping bridge this gap. And so we have three there's different ones, you know, electronics and materials, energy. We're focused in biomanufacturing. So we have Nimble, which is the National Institute for Innovation and Manufacture Biopharmaceuticals. That would be those vaccines, antibodies, and cells, or, or cell products. We have um, Biofab. That would be regenerative medicine. That would be stem cells. That would be um, artificial organs, things like that. They can make a like a bladder now. It's amazing what people can do now with stem cells and, and cell manufacturing. And then the newest one is uh, called Biomain. They received $87 million from the Department of Defense. Um, 
So they are connected with big companies, um, smaller companies, equipment manufacturers, and um, and other companies. I don't think I have SBI. But this was the older one. SBI is now should be up here. Um, and then these are the universities, including Albany State. So I, that's how I met Ashok. We had an initial kind of kickoff meeting, and I say, "Hey, you're in Georgia. I'm in Georgia. You know, let's." Let's work together. So we put together a grant. And so our project is focused on um, building a do-it-yourself virus. So why, why is that important? So the cost of a bioreactor, even a small one, you know, something that could grow cells the size of like a, like a gallon of milk, that costs about $30,000 or more, up to $100,000. These are typically not within the um, uh, budgets of most schools. You know, UGA, we were able to get a couple for education purposes, but most schools, you can't get any. If you've got, you know, a room full of students like we have here, you're not going to be able to have enough equipment to be able to teach what you need to teach. And so we're building this system in con uh, collaboration with uh, this uh, company, Blue Sends. And so they're supplying some of the software. We're taking parts and, and putting them together to create a, a system that will be maybe five to 10 times cheaper than your uh, traditional bioreactor systems. Um, some other projects we've been funded with Biome, one is called the Antigen Racer Project. So here we're, we're design, build, and test um, systems to, to manufacture COVID antigens. So, We've previously been working with the CDC, providing with them with this protein called the spike protein. So this is analogous to the hemagglutinin molecule I touched on earlier. So this is how the virus gets into the cell. And so it's an antigenic determinant. So you can do a lysis and test for COVID. Um, and so we're trying to get ways where we can make this cheaper, make more of it, and you know, make variants on a rapid scale. Um, we're also working with um, a continuous manufacturing project where we're making this chemical called glucaric acid. That's with Calion. Um, and so this is continuous manufacturing is kind of a new area. So you can think about it like, um, you know, the, uh, a device, you know, where you press a button and then all this stuff happens and you get like a bacon and eggs on the plate, you know, like the egg broke me. They are not explaining this very well, but it's essentially like a device where you've got a lot of steps, and it's like one button and you get a product. And so this is really huge in the industry now is being able to do a continuous system and where all this, the steps can be done kind of with minimal supervision. So we're working on that. And then we have some potential projects coming up with some other companies and the, the Naval uh, Surface Warfare Center, which is down in uh, Panama City, not too far from here. Um, Okay, these are some of the innovations we talk about. So we're working with uh, scientific bioprocessing on their new, what they call DOTS. This is a processing software that will allow you to um, detect biomass in a culture and then respond to that biomass by adding in a feed. So we talked about this fed batch earlier. So fed batch is where you're feeding in sugar to grow your cells. And so this system kind of does it all automatically. We're also working with Cooner Shaker. They're making what's called an off-gas analyzer. So when you know you breathe in air, you're going to use the O2 and you expire CO2, right? So this instrument here measures the O2 and the CO2. So we really have what's called a mass balance of everything that's going into your culture, everything that's going out. So we understand that process better. And then we're also building our own bioreactor. So I mentioned. So just the bioreactor itself can be several thousand, like seven to ten thousand dollars just to buy that. So we're manufacturing this at UGA. So we have a glass blowing shop where we can um, make the glass for the system. We have um, metal fabrication shop where we can basically make the head plate for this. And then this is 3D. This black part is 3D printed, so it connects the head plate to the glass vessel. And so. Those all um, are, are being built um, on campus to help support, you know, a place like Albany State where we can manufacture this, send that down here, 
you all could have your own system for a fraction of the cost of what it would take to buy it. Okay, so other projects that we're working on um, that I'm interested in are um, what we call pet degrading enzymes. I'm not talking about your dog or your cat. So pet is uh, plastic, so it's in your water bottles, like your Coke bottle, water, you know. Um, it's huge, obviously plastic is a huge problem. You have this whole island of garbage in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And so a few years ago, there was a, um, a group in Japan that were, they were able to find an organism that can break that plastic down. And it makes an enzyme called pet ace. And so we're studying that enzyme, trying to produce it um, in the lab. So this is kind of production strategy, you know, where you have your, your protein oh, down here, maybe a fusion protein connected to it, and then you purify it, run, run what we call a gel to analyze that product. Um, so we're creating other things like for COVID detection. Um, we're working actually with those S rates I talked about at the beginning that I did my PhD on with Michelle O'Malley in California. And then we're working on an enzyme called TAB that can cleave protein. So basically if you have this protein here, you have a tag, it can cleave that protein off of your tag. It's a way to kind of clean up your protein and remove tags. You can, it just makes it easier to study and crystallize those proteins. Um, so finally, I want to um, uh, tell you a little bit about some of our other um, opportunities. So we have uh, some asynchronous courses in biomanufacturing that we offer through our continuing ed program. And I'm connecting um, a show with some of the, the videos and things, but you can actually take this course and get continuing ed credit. Um, we also have a, um, uh, a YouTube channel that you um, that we have all these videos on the different uh, biomanufacturing topics. So, um, so I'll stop there and see if we have any questions. I don't know if anybody had on Slido. So we've got a um, couple of questions. I'll go through. Is how much opportunity do you anticipate for trained biomanufacturing scientists to become successful entrepreneurs in the field? That is an excellent question. We actually had a former student that started her own company. Um, at least at, at UGA, we have what's called the Innovation Center. So you have uh, students can actually get money from the university to help start their own companies. We have a pitch contest where you can go and pitch your ideas to entrepreneurs in the room. Um, Delta has invested in what we call the Delta Innovation Center. So it's a whole building basically for entrepreneurs to gather. They have office space. Um, we have um, actually an entrepreneurship certificate that you can get as part of the, the Master Biomanufacturing Program. So you get trained in that area and then uh, Dr. Bob Pinkney, who works, um, he's a director of that program. He also directs the, the lab where they um, students can come in and, and work with him on their, their ideas. So we had um, the last pitch that I was at, they had a student, she developed a, um, a device that can detect chemicals that are released from your body before you have an epileptic seizure. So it helps you um, basically mitigate those kind of issues. We had a, um, another person, she's developing uh, enzymes to, to treat metabolic diseases. So a lot of cool ideas. I mean, don't think, like if you have an idea that you can't bring it to market, because we have students that are doing that every day. And so as part of this master's program, you know, you might come up with a, an idea based on things that you learn about in class. Great question. All right, another one is, what kind of remote work positions exist in the field of biomanufacturing? That's a really good question. Um, so for actually like, you think about like you're making insulin, that would be really tough to do remotely, but there are other jobs, like say you're doing data analysis or quality control data analysis, bioinformatics is huge, sequence analysis. So you have an organism, you sequence a genome, you have to, basically process the, um, the information from that genome sequence. That is another um, opportunity for doing remote work. Um, good question. 
Let's see, are there any current scholarships to help students who are interested in the field of biomanufacturing? Our, originally, we were funded by the National Science Foundation, so we were able to offer some assistantships to get the program running, but we moved to a tuition-based model now. Um, we don't specifically have assistantships through that program, but what I do tell students is, you know, this is an investment in your future. So say you graduate now, you you may say 30,000 at a job. If you could, you know, go in and, and pay like 20,000 in tuition and then make 60 or 70,000 a year, wouldn't you want to make that investment? So that's kind of kind of the way I, I pitch this to people. The, the, the facts are that most employers don't want people with just a bachelor's degree. I know that's probably not what you want to hear today, but they want people with specific skills and training. And, um, and that's basically what we bring to bear. Tonight.